It was interesting as we talked about uh, getting our, um, our itinerary together for today, we realized that we had some uh, in things in common. So we decided to take a few of the common themes. One is uh, food, the other is politics, and the other one is um, Spanish. And just kind of do a back and forth on that one. So this first one, it turns out that I wrote a poem uh, on Tetzcatlipoca and so did uh, Ricardo. And Tetzcatlipoca, for those of you who may not know, was, is a major deity of the Nahuatl ancient Mesoamerican people. And Tetzcatlipoca has the characteristics of a trickster. He's a very rough teacher of lessons for many of us and really challenges us with our illusions. So um, I'm going to read my take on Tetzcatlipoca, and then Ricardo will. Is it the time of Tetzcatlipoca, keeper of the smoking mirror, Nahuatl trickster, divine guide? Is it the time of obscured hearts and faces? With idle illusions, we adorn our fears. With masks, we hide our greed. Is this how he makes us his? Without pure hearts or a true face, the mirror remains clouded. Will we be the inheritors of smoke? Illuminant, illumine our mirror, O giver of life, like the sun reflect our light. It was long nights of half sleep behind paper doors, sad air that rushed through ceiling ribs, boxed belongings that soared like pagodas that dried my heart. Tezcatlipoca brought me here to remember cold nights lit by flickering candles, brought me here to breathe what was forgotten. Memory like the ocean, infinite, leaves blue foam at my lips. Sigues allí como siempre, enseñándome. Me encuentras en los momentos que, que flaquece mi esperanza y el hambre me enlaza. Que se enrosquen higos en mis piernas y brazos, llena mi plato de miel y trigo, haz que broten pan mis labios. So now that we've invo in invoked Tetzcatlipoca and he's hanging out with us here, be careful. Um, our next section was food because, um, well, who doesn't like food, but especially if it's good food and we're in the Bay Area with some of the best food. So um, I have some food-related poems, and one of them is called Dolly's Watch. I was just tripping out on um, how he makes, Dolly, the artist, makes everything melt. I really like that image. Dolly's watch tells the time. It is too soon to remember, too late to forget. I fidgeted in your arms last night, that familiar tangle of heat and levitating syllables. My passion stuttered in my veins, liberating me from the work of getting to know you better. When your hands of salt rubbed the swell of my stomach, I felt like freshly rising bread, hot and vaporous. I stayed awake all night in fear that you would want to have me for breakfast in the morning, spread marmal pineapple marmalade on my shoulders, wash me down with a cup of café con leche. You smelled like ether I wanted to go under so bad. Perhaps we were primos in another life, kissing cousins in the land of Mu, Babylonian babes who grew up to be saboteurs in the Tower of Babel. Our reincarnation finds us in this world of Miami meanderings where we have shared omnivisions, danced on the tops of conga drums, joined the book of the Century Club, debated the politics of taxi cabs, searched for the lost treasures of Little Havana. We have minced words wrapped in bacon, delectable appetizers for the main entree, Distance, flambe, served with a side of corazón picante and a fine red wine. Is it time for dinner yet? I consult Dolly's watch. The minute hands are melting into the question of the next second. I look for answers on its tilting face, but it is either 
too fast to be accurate or too slow to care. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is an ode uh, to Mole. <clears throat> Colorado, Almendrado, emaciated ghosts of archbishops and viceroy viceroys drift on pre-Columbian aromas, rattling spoons on cobblestones, dragging copper pots, aching for Aztec gold, pangs satiated by kitchen saints of colonial Puebla. Amarillo, Fray Pascual's bulky burlap robe bumps spices into boiling broth. Holy urgency transfigures water into mole. Juan de Palaflox y Mendoza, Spain's viceroy, decreed mole a colonial treasure between steaming mouthfuls. Chichilo, convent of Santa Rosa's impoverished nuns at wit's end while an archbishop waits to be fed. Sor Andrea de la Asuncion mills stale bits and spice under divine inspiration. Her fragrant sauce poured on wiry turkeys. The sanctified plump gut pleased. Pipian. Long before Cortez sailed into Veracruz, Moyi simmered in earthen pots, poured on iguana, asholots, acosil, larvae, insects, mushrooms, turkey, duck, dog, deer. Negro, verde, mancha manteles, cosmic Vasconcelian sauce drips from Tlaltecutli's nine mouths as starving colonial ghosts wander, thumbing beads at dusk, whispering ingredient rosaries. Cacahuate, pasilla, pasas, pepitas, calabaza, piñones, plátano, canela, chocolate, ajonjolí, ajo, ancho. The food becomes the prayer and makes me hungry. Mm -hmm. Well, also, I mean, you get a really good idea of the, um, what the, the native populations of the Americas have contributed to our entire world. You know, these are foods that we can now find everywhere. This is a little bit off kind of poem about food, but it serves its purpose. It's called Spousal Rape. She sat coolly, the morning cooking in her lap. Short attacks of bay water filled her eyes. The lion arrived for lunch. She had just dressed her thigh for the main dish. He swaggered sideways against her ear. They landed entangled in the cat's milk and struggled horizontally on the whiskers of a low growl. How many meals they managed, no one is certain. Only the teeth marks on her throat will ever say. Another personal favorite here, uh, Pan Dulce, right? En los primeros días de la cosecha, metates y morteros de piedra transformaban semillas en pequeños panes de amaranto con miel, copal y, y pan, ofrendas para Tlaloc, he who makes things sprout. Puebla de Los Ángeles, sincretismo de gastronomía indígena con la de conquistadores europeos, se recombina en harina, elevadura, sal, azúcar, Fray Toribio de Benavente Motolinia declares, warm earth sprouts year round, unlike Spain's frosty soil. Exalts inexhaustible wheat harvests of the Poblano Valley, nuns of Concepcion, Santa Catalina de Siena, San Bernardo, Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, Santa Teresa la Nueva, Santa Clara, Santa Monica, Santa Rosa de Viterbo. Knead, twist, braid, Sweetened, salted arrays of doughy concoctions to feed starving believers. Sorijuana Inés de la Cruz transcribed 17 of her cloister's bread recipes 
in the margins of epistolary tomes she wrote in isolation. Tacubaya's first patisseries, El Globo, El Molino, spill baguettes and croissants into dusty 1800 Mexico City streets. Monsieur Remontel's airy pastries sparks war in 1828. King Louis Philippe blockades the Gulf with interlocking pastry booms and pummels San Juan de Uloa, forcing a 600,000 peso reparation to be paid in flour, yeast, and sugar. After military honors rang, Santa Ana's, Santa Ana's leg was buried on amaranth and honey wafers. <laughs> Oh yeah, Santana's leg, it got around. Mm -hmm. Really it did. Okay, Pumpling Heart. Murmur of love, upbeat and open, palpable breath beat of ocean waves. Delicious fruit, pumpling heart, red blue tempo of cosmic breath. My place with you on this unraveling planet is on the backs of Goyal Shauki, celestial sprinter into time. Let's ride her spinning integration, her full moon cycles, her spatial chaos, her galactic soul. Let's stir her into steaming coffee, sip her magic, feel her force. Let's taste her spirit, ingest her soul as she makes her way to our chambers of flesh and light. Thank you. <laughs> now, Goyal Shauki, I... We'll just do one of those shameless, you know, solicitations here. But speaking of Goyal Shauki, uh, this is an image of Goyal Shauki, who is the moon goddess, the Mesoamerican moon goddess. And I just read from my new book called Exiled Moon, which deals with different kinds of exile going on on the planet. Um, so, and I brought some with me in case you're, you're interested. Thank you. So next we're going to do a, one more on the food or, yeah? Sure, or or, or, or we, we can go to the next. Uh, okay. Is this the, do you want to do the politics? Yeah. Um, yeah. You go okay. ahead. Sure. Yes. All right. Oh, the undocumented ones? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So this one's titled Undocumented, and it's a uh, emulation poem. So it's, uh, it follows the pattern of uh, Roque Dalton's Poema de Amor para los Guanacos. <clears throat> the ones who pick fruit, vegetables, carve slaughter flesh, slaughterhouse flesh, scrub floors, and restaurant dishes, trim garden plants, harvest orchards and vineyards, cook and labor 12 hours a day, care for someone's children, push fabric and food into the whir of machines. The ones who endure psychological torment if they step out of their neighborhoods. The ones who live hidden in gated Jasper mansions. The ones whose homelands have been occupied by transnational great trade agreements. The ones forgotten as unions and politicians yarn about a living wage. The ones who fight for wobbly shade and lukewarm water in the fuming sun while bosses lounge on dollar bill Adirondacks. The ones whose children face the blade of cutbacks first while our economy dances on stilts made of their skin and bone. The ones who disappear in border prison, uh, the border prison profit system deemed invisible by the law, forsaken by their home governments in border gulags. The ones who gleam gilded harvesting crops to feed America like a compassionate Christ on the mount feeding multitudes with inexhaustible baskets. The ones who build civilizations with corn and blood. My sisters and brothers, my aunts and uncles, my neighbors, my friends, my family, my people. Okay, people of the harvest. The crushed grape withers on the vine. No gnarled hands to pick it. No one to make wine. Let us now lost wilts on its road, the empty fields forgotten by scythe and sickle and hoe. Cotton worms slowly drying in the sun if there were backs to carry it, but there are none. Fruit long past ripe falls heavy to the ground and bursts its rotting entrails with a sluggish sound. 
The fields are all in mourning, rotting blackly in their sorrow. For the people of the harvest who will not return tomorrow. The grapevine now a grave mark for every back-wrenched soul that spent a life of labor and died giving birth to growth. The poison that protects the field often kills the worker. The sun that ignites orchards to bloom beats hard upon the child and sucks life away. When the fields have finished rotting and gives itself to bloom, be aware of the many souls in the orchards, perfume, in the fine green skin of the plant, in the sweetness of the fruit, in the soil dark with my people's blood, in the fiber of the root. <clears throat> Frozen food capital. In adolescent memory, steam billows from distant cannery stacks. The mustard corrugated shell was an intrusion in vast fields. It seemed to grow, it seemed to shrink as I grew. Memories of steamed vegetable wisps that clung to my mother's white plastic apron remind me of the years she toiled to raise her children and her fight for a future. In 1985, picket line snipers hurled volcanic rocks through scab windshields. National news networks flashed our struggle into America's living rooms. 1,500 workers unite. Union boss Fred Heim underestimated the will of workers tired of, tired of empty promises and deals undercutting worker wages. Life paused for 19 months. Sergio Lopez, the Teamster puppet, grinned, stringing us along with, my hands are tied. School friends disappeared from class, moved, evicted. $50 weekly benefits, not enough to pay the bills. Next up, us. Boxes packed, loaded car, muffler exhaling cancer, where to go? At lunch, we delivered lunch plates that mother ate in the crisscross shadow of a cyclone fence. Origami tortilla folds as she listened to shouts in the distance. Fiery clashes peaked when teamsters in the owner's pocket ended the strike. The emboldened few walked back with dignity, having defeated the ominous Richard Shaw. Only half of the original workers returned to the conveyor lines for less than they negotiated. After the anger and struggle, a worker gleamed into living rooms across America and declared, we are not afraid. The Western work ethic and the overworked ethnic. I saw your eyes tumble out of your head under the weight of a sack of gold. The Spaniard had declared you a beast of burden and refused to acknowledge your skin and bones left to dry in mottled roads with only the teeth of dogs to redeem them. A century or so later, the church it took you a hundred years to build ripped the arms from your body and used them as flags to fly atop palacios de gobiernos that waved in bruised colors of broken fingers and sweating hands. Later in that century, I saw your swollen lungs expand sluggishly under a heavy layer of mine dust until they expanded and vanished into the makers of the short-handled hoe. Crushed between high suns and low wages, you were one more hard worker buried under the ground that had been taken from your ancestors. Today, I am witness to your pinpricked fingers as they inch along endless rows of zippers. You have been sewing all your life in some poorly lit cell that is stealing your eyes. Piecework and peonage are stitched into the lining of your eyelids. Each decade and every century have been your labor camp where you have worked, worked, worked in varying states of slavery and manipulated cheap labor under an enforced work ethic that declares you lazy and shiftless, people of manana, conniving welfare cheaters, and you continue to peel the fields for expanding stomachs 
dig ditches for foundations, and piece together fabric for next year's fall fashions while your own belly shrivels in humiliated nakedness as you prepare to dissolve one more time into the dust that will cover you with the fruitlessness of your labor. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, this is titled El Macho. All right. So if you see me out on the street, I might not say hi to you because I got to look tough. All right. I just, I don't smile when I'm out on the street. Okay. I don't eat treats or candy while I'm out on the street because I got to be a macho, you know. Just kidding. Just kidding. El macho never gets blisters from chopping wood. El macho only wears rugged looking shoes. El macho wears boots in bed. El macho says getting ahead means cheating chumps. El macho never eats red sauce cooked by strange women. When exasperated, a macho sweat is flammable. El macho may shapeshift into a gentleman to seduce young ladies. El macho grows stronger with every emotion he suppresses. El macho never loses underwear, lest they be buried under a woman's house. El macho flirts aggressively to avoid any question of his masculinity. In macho land, conversations end in abrupt silences. El macho can paraphrase feminist and gender schema theory to don a cardboard hat of gender dynamic consciousness. El macho expects food to disappear at the, to appear at the wave of a belt. El macho concludes women who deny him must be lesbians. El macho does not speak to kids, instead speaks at kids. El macho only smiles when his team wins or when he's drunk. El macho only weeps when his team loses or when he's drunk. I'm in, I'm in recovery from a slip. Okay, so um, <clears throat> a thin line. Oh, excuse me, that's not the one. Um, eek. We talked about doing the um, gender. His, his macho goes pretty much with a poem that I have written called When You Look At Me, A Brown Woman's Lament. <clears throat> When you look at me, you see motel maids changing sheets in the pink and gray rooms your parents stay in. You see dark brown women on their knees scrubbing floors in Baja restaurants or standing with a blue-eyed child on each hip. It doesn't matter if I wear tweed suits and paste the floor on Gavinci heels in front of busy chalkboards. To you, you see Lumita, Lupita, the nanny, in your TV mind. She wears mismatched clothes and slides heavily on leather huaraches towards her unwashed children. To you, I am an aberration that confuses your senses and blurs your vision. It is difficult for you to recognize me as doctor. You want me to remain nameless, silent, invisible. But I stand before you, speaking your language and teaching you things you're not sure of. Now you must either change the misguided notion of who I am or kill the me that cannot live in your world. Two, when you look at me, you see educated nipples, intelligent legs, a brilliant ass. You chica mija chula me until you get beyond the fact that I have a PhD. In department meetings, I call for broad visions and student needs. You envision abroad who can meet your needs. You are unfamiliar with the woman who can see through your veneer. My loud, clear voice threatens your ears. To you, I am expendable, like the woman who keeps taking you back, like the mother who is always there to feed you, like that part of yourself that you thought you destroyed when you decided to become a thin, worn, metallic chair, a conflict without a resolution.
something now. Okay. All right. Um, <coughs> so we're going to <coughs> I think I'll go with. So this one's titled Medianoche. Medianoche en susurros esperando la luna entre telarañas pesadas con rocío. Ojos de libélulas parparean entre índigo y cuarzo humeado. Marea turquesa burbujea en la bahía rodeada por puentes de acero y oro. Hojas y alambres raspan contra ladrillo como resuellos de seres etéreos rompiendo mi solitud. Pasos de un inquilino sonámbulo hacen el piso chillar, resollar nostalgia de madera antigua por tiempos en que se mecía entre nubes y brisas sazonado por mareas distantes, antes que llegaran galeones franciscanos con filamentos que arden y tiemblan y vibran. Me ca caigo de rodillas es a poem that I wrote um, shortly after visiting Mexico City for the first time. I'm LA born and raised and came up as a Chicana. My parents are both, um, they're Mexican and also born, uh, one was born in, in Texas and the other came to Texas as a child from Mexico. And so when I saw Mexico City, it was like, I felt like I found home, just the feeling. But it was also very, um, there's identity, you know, crisis involved in an experience like this. Like, who am I really? What am I as a Mexican American in the United States compared to being Mexican from Mexico? And, and people from Mexico didn't always see me as Mexican, just like many people in the United States didn't see me as being an American either. So this is part of that, and it's, it's um, in Spanish. Me caigo de rodillas. Me caigo de rodillas en el país de México, searching for unanswered prayers lost in the shrill cries of beggars and vendors, suffering through a brubbled mortar of ruined time. En la lluvia de mi vida, que cae en torrentos sin cesar, veo miradas oscuras, fragments of a lost language, fingers of changing culture. No soy de ti, pero algo me llama a tu lado. Me pierdo en las palabras lagrimosas de tus poetas, en los grandes murales que cubren edificios muriendo en silencio. Tus pirámides, tus castillos de pierda, sangre en gotas de mi existencia, se revuelvan en la lluvia que no cesa. What do I search for? The poison of my country chokes the eagle, debilitates the serpent, eats at the feathers and skin of your soul. Conozco bien la pena que se refleja en los ojos inmensos y oscuros de tu gente. México, el gran México de mis ilusiones, de mis sueños torcidos. Mi México, que no es mío. Todavía tengo sabor de vida, dolor de lucha. Y te voy a dejar y regresar para así llegar a tu lado a beber, a beber la sangre que es mía. A little memory, I guess, working with memory. All right. <clears throat> this is titled Soul Garden. You fumbled, crumpled, lunch money, dollar bills. We walked past Neon, toy sprinkled sandboxes, televisions blared, melodramatic lovers from a telenovela, 
Cars skim gently, silently in the distance. We copped a J from George, the tall dude who wore crisp red Converse, white walls as he patrolled the block for outsiders. We sat in your stepdad's garden, surrounded by seedlings incubated in his windowsill nursery. An apricot stood 10 feet tall, chayotes, zucchinis, corn stalks wound their way into our thoughts. Little Anthony, the Tempris, the Delphonics, Billy Stewart, old soul anthems dedicated to secret crushes, one per song. Peach fuzz mustache middle school dreamers inhaling emerald breaths. I have one for that. This is um, what Adriana said. And um, let me see if I can find it over here. <clears throat> OK. Hmm. OK, where did it go? It should be here. OK, the photograph, 22. <clears throat> and this is also um, a little bit of the uh, LA Chicano flavor with the love story in the back. It's called The Photograph. What Antonia said, her blustering petticoats rushing down red steps. Antonia of the saints in her nightmares, the lost soul in the beautiful face. Antonia of the orange lips, the French twist, the tiny waist above full swirling skirts poised tentatively on spiked heels. Antonia of the absent self, the misplaced alma, the searching wound. What Antonia said as she looped elegant into the shimmering blue fin Chevy chrome shield of earthbound goddess, what Antonia said to Diego, Diego, the uncertain myth, the constructed man, the navigated ego of place and placement, Diego of the calloused hands, the restless heart, the palpitating spear eyes, the caged spirit that made him swell each time he looked at Antonia, sweet chocolate candy beneath the sugar starch stiffness of her musical skirts. What Antonia said to Diego was, I will be tus noches de aire filled with Perez Prado, the platters, the eternal strains of cha-cha soul. I will be your wet dreams and dry eyes at midnight, your diosa to cruise fluorescent gaias, the fuchsia of noches ansiosas that will sometimes color your face. This will be one moment in many, sueños del futuro que nunca van ser realizados, initials carved into peeling bark of swaying eucalyptus trees, sunsets over Chinatown, hungry kisses in the park. This will be August 8th, 1958, and I will love you forever. <clears throat> All right. Follow the levee toward the hills down 152. Beyond the old land grant mansions before San Benito where the road bends. Turn left. A 50s labor camp digs into the ground invisible to the uninitiated. Two dozen cars lined up, mud kicked tires tracked forays into town. We met in the damp community room and tutored latchkey kids, homework assignments. After, we launched a wheezy basketball from a cement pad through a rusty hoop. At five o'clock, a woman would strut in with candles and lugging a chip plaster virgin spangled with paper roses. She cautioned parents to keep the kids away from the berets. Near the end of tutoring time, her assistants unwrapped candles, poured wine, and cracked hosts. Once, once she smirked at us as she led her flock around the camp to amass believers, clan candles clenched. I want to 
wanted to um, read this one, A Thin Line for the Women of Juarez, that deals with the, um, um, the brutality of femicide that is occurring um, in not only um, the northern borders of Mexico, but also in Guatemala, also in uh, Canada. <clears throat> and there's been a history of almost uh, 25, 30 years where women are disappearing. These are women who work and uh, are disappearing and show, uh, if they show up at all, their, bo their bodies have been tortured and they're, they're dead. It is a wide desert and a thin line, thin as ropes that bind the wrist of undernourished women. It is a vast plain of unmitigated history and a slim knife that cuts off the breasts of would-be mothers. It is a mother load of corporate profit and a ribbon of bleeding throats. It is a mass grave of terror and rape and a small slice of our uncertain futures. It is large enough to hide the bones of suffocated women, but not quiet enough to stifle their cries. Kill us when you can. Torture us when you can. Bury us if you can. But the spirits of women who die in battle will return as fierce hummingbirds, winged warriors of history, hovering memory of your forgotten humanity. A border is only an imaginary line. All hearts are the center of the universe. We had it planned out, and now that it's like open, I'm like, oh, where do I go? What do I do? Okay. Um, so this is an ode to the angels. Uh, oh, perfect. Thank you. Uh, or Boyle Heights. This is a piece I wrote a long time ago. <clears throat> to the smell of dormant drains along dusty drags. To the sound of people talking, laughing among the sounds of steel and churning wheels. To the warm air that streams down narrow streets, refreshing the passerbys from the sidewalk sadness and arid sherbet sunsets. To the surprise of a bird song in a withered city tree scarred by pocket knives and runaway shopping carts. To the people with smiling caramel faces that fill the streets on their way to unknown places. To my Susanna Jones, who told me from dreary times to iridescent nebula and solar eclipses. To the elementary school kids whose innocence reminds me of times that once were and of those that are yet to be. To the sirens that call out for justice only to find the night lit by stars and orange street lamps. To the rain that brings a smell of wet earth to feet exhausted from treading cement and asphalt to the land that has become the grazing pastures of sitcom caricatures, to the buildings, countless like grains of rice in a dusty bowl that cracks under desert suns. I hear a lot of like similarities in our even images. Kind of, have you been reading all my stuff and copying me? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, something a little more uplifting, Mexicles, which is a, um, it's a slang term for Mexico, Mexico City. And this is that first poem I did that was so lamenting. That was one of my first trips to Mexico City. This is a more recent one. And it has a lot to do with uh, my love for dance and, and dancing. I would have loved to dance with you, Mexicles, in the plaza at Mitla, rumbled around thick columns, pirouetted in corners that zigzagged across ancient walls, those 
geometric intersections. I would have loved to dance, my red face turned upwards towards the sun, black dress swirling in the heated wind, my heart a palpitating drumbeat while my feet performed an offering to the death and rebirth of things. I would have loved to dance with you, Mexicle, Mexicles in the kiosk of Oaxaca with pineapple princesses around me and the elegant sway of their smiles or atop the pyramid of the moon, undulating torso, captivating movements in rhythmic search for the lingering face of the mother. I would have loved to dance, oh, how I would have loved to dance in Garibaldi Square with a lusty mariachi, squeezing the strains of violins like milk through my thighs, jarocho high and intoxicated by the perfume of brandy, coronas, and mezcal. I would have loved to dance with you, sweet Mexicles, a quick hot jump of Aztec in my toes, bracelets of chachayotes on my wrists, drumbeats staggering eternally in my heart, corazón pumpling Mexicles through the epidermal layers of stone and clay. I would have loved to dance, my obsidian eyes wide as night sky, flicking gold off my tongue, my legs pulsing to the mu music pumice stone makes inside the temples of Teotihuacan. But my feet were still as my spirit raced up the steps of Monte Alban, slipping into Zapotec tombs and inching through chambers of Olmec jade. But my feet were still deer hoofed poised for sudden explanations of time and space, past and future, the quin cunts of light that make spirits rest inside the mouth of Quetzalcoatl. Now so far away from your sun and moon, the border that gave me birth holds your memory like music, a song in search of a dance replace in my soul, a song that has waited in the distance for the instrument of my legs to give it life. In this land so needy of spirit, I give birth to the dance I carry deep within me, a boisterous and feral palpitation. Your magic is my life force as my feet activate currents of light in my ankles and electricity in my body, the colors of your red clay and gold mountains wrap around my feet. In my kitchen, I am dancing. In my bedroom, I am dancing. In my living room, I am dancing. In the streets, I am dancing. The dances you gave me, there where the earth pulsates and waits for the dances to come. Mexicles, your melody is life, rhythm, and music. Movimiento, quinto sol. Right. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. This is titled Belizean Rain. Walking in Belizean rain, making friends while winding along brittle asphalt ribbons by bus, smiles, handshakes, laughter. I mean, new old friend. Lost in Belizean rain, my heart is silent, isolated. It speaks. Walking in Belizean rain, I mean, you old friend. Goel Shauki, again. Ceremonia Goel Shauki. This, um, I've written a poem and it's an offering to Goel Shauki in both English and Spanish. And so we'll, I'll be ending with this one. Okay. Moon goddess, woman, black, obscure, divine, occultress of night, mistress of light, unleashed into blue plate night, offering of sugar flame and of thin smoke rising. Enter the gateway of flowing hair, portal of leaving. Enter and fill basket of fruit, glass of water, lake of light. Enter the circle, queen of night, and souls broken. Enter, create, spiral of stardust, Provide me your power, my ancient song. Ceremonia coel shauki, diosa de luna, mujer negro oculto divina, divino amante de planetas y dueña de luz soltado dentro, plato noche azul, ofrenda de azúcar, fuego y de humo liguero. Entre la salida de cabello suelto, portal de salir. Entre y llena, canesta de fruta, vaso de agua, lago de luz. Entra el círculo, reina de rayos y de almas quebradas. Entra, criadora de sueños, espiral de estrellas, 
Dame tu fuerza, mi antigua canción. Thank you.